Now, the next speaker, as Tula mentioned, is a member of this group. He's also a very good friend of Wilma. He's also somebody that we have been working extensively with, Tim and his colleague at the International Energy Agency Greenhouse Gas Research and Development Program. Tim will speak to us about the global potential of biomass with carbon capture and storage. Tim, please. And please welcome Tim. To here to uh, help celebrate your 25th anniversary. Um, it's an honor and a privilege, and in fact, as Paul said, uh, I've worked with Bologna for several years in uh, ZEP and in the UNFCCC. And I can honestly say that they, they really do have an impact. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, so you've heard, the, uh, heard it mentioned a few times already about biomass for CCS as a negative emission technology. And the key question is, is it significant? Can it make a difference? Does it have much potential? Um, I'm from the IA Greenhouse Gas Program, which is an international collaborative research program uh, funded by its members, and we commission studies and networks and research projects. And this is a, one of the recent studies we've done on biomass CCS, looking at this question of global potential. Um, it's also nice, as well as the Bologna's 25th anniversary, it's our 20th anniversary this year as well. So we'll be celebrating later on this year uh, in London. Um, and we're funded by 21 countries and 34 organizations that uh, are our members. And the funding amounts from the countries uh, is dependent upon their greenhouse gas emissions. So the largest emitters pay the most of our membership. But this is what the, the, the clever work that was done here by Ecofit, and I'll describe that in a moment. Um, I just like this diagram because it explains it uh, in, in a nice visual way about why we're interested in why, how this works. This represents the emissions from fossil fuel use. And with renewable energy, that's really good because you get less emissions. And with biomass used for energy, it's the, the photosynthesis is <coughs> capturing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and when you convert that in the energy process, it's released again. So it's, so it's neutral in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And you add CCS to fossil fuels, as you know, you, you reduce the emissions significantly. 85, 90%. If you take this to bioenergy bio and uh, add CCS, then you're using the natural system that's taken the CO2 out of the atmosphere and you're now putting it in geological formations. So that's how it works as a negative emission uh, technology. Um, and we may really need these negative emission technologies. The fourth uh, assessment report from the RPTC and some of the future emission scenarios show that we will need such and if you're looking around at what's near to market and available, um, biomass energy is, is relatively available and understood technology, and CCS is, is relatively understood, and we have demonstration projects as well. So they're both uh, near to market. So we've also looked at other issues around this as well, and I'll mention just briefly at the end on the carbon market side. Um, but what we did in this case, um, because people were talking about this, uh, we thought we would contribute by getting an understanding of the actual, uh, trying to quantify the contribution that could be made from this combination of these two technologies. So Ecofis, actually, in the Netherlands, uh, did the clever work on this for us. Uh, the main author there uh, was Joris Cornet. And what they did for us um, was in a two-stage process. They, they looked at the existing work around the world to identify the main potential types of biomass and the main technologies to use that biomass in energy conversion processes, looking at getting the, the, uh, the, the sort of top numbers here. Um, and then to do their own techno-economic assessments uh, of the potential for biomass for CCS in a, in a global uh, context. Um, it's a very comprehensive piece of work they've done for us, um, and we're due to publish it as a report uh, next month. Just to explain how they did this, um, they looked at two time scales of 2030 and 2050, so in 20 years' time and in, in 40 years' time. Um, they looked at different types of potential. They looked at the technical potential that's technically feasible and is just related to the conversion efficiency and fuel stock supply, etc. Uh, the realizable potential, 
take into account restrictions such as capital stock turnover and any future earnings demand forecasts. And they also look at economic potential and they look at into an energy mix with other technology options and cost curves and how it works in a competitive environment. <coughs> Um, and as I said, they started from using the existing work that's out there, and so they use the existing work on biomass uh, supply potential, and they use the existing work on CO2 storage potential around the world. And the two sectors that have, they found have the most potential, they then focused on, was large-scale electricity generation and biofuel production, biofuels that generally get used in, in the transport sector. And within those, they identified six different technologies they focused to work on. And that was pulverized coal with CCS in a co-firing mode. And we already have this happening uh, in some places at the moment. Um, a dedicated 100% biomass going into a circulated fertilized bed with CCS. Um, an IGCC, integrated gasification combined cycle, which is another power sector technology um, on co-firing with biomass and fossil fuels. And then again, a dedicated biomass IGTC uh, as well. And on the biofuel side, they looked at um, <coughs> bioethanol production. And because they were looking ahead in these timescales in the context of future emissions reductions, um, they looked at the advanced uh, technologies for bioethanol. Uh, so those that will um, uh, use uh, lignin cellulose based biomass, such as wood and straw. Um, and things that are, at the moment the conventional bioethanol is produced from crops such as sugar, starch based crops. So they're looking ahead at these technologies and also uh, on the biodiesel side, the fish crops, gasification with fish, fish crops by diesel, um, is the stick technology. Um, in looking at these, they looked at the greenhouse gas emissions of a complete supply chain from the production side of the biofuel, biomass transport, the conversion process, and any wastes as well. They undertook a sensitivity analysis on all their assumptions. Um, and they also, within the report, very usefully, where there are some studies that look at elements of this, did a comparison and explanation of any similarities and any differences. So a very thorough job was undertaken. Um, a really important aspect, of course, is the supply of biomass, and that it has to be from sustainable sources. We've seen the problems that have arisen and concerns that have arisen with palm oil um, and we want to make sure that's not factored in in this where people apply more rigorous criteria for sustainability on vitamin supply in the future. So again from the literature they've used the highest level of criteria uh, in determining the biomass supply potential. That takes into account uh, the issues you can see there and including indirect land use change. Well, <coughs> um, to make it feasible for them, they've, they've regionalised the world in terms of the biomass potential. So it's not only been done down to a country or a local level, but it's been done to a regional level into seven regions of the world. Um, and this is just the chart of the regional biomass uh, potential. And they've combined this with the regional CO2 geological storage as well. Um, in doing this, um, the three categories of biomass that came out as having the highest potential that they focused on again um, were energy crops, forestry residues, and agricultural residues. Again, drawing this from the and that was in, in terms of so the, the technical potential, which is the highest level uh, potential, as you, uh, as you might expect. Um, uh, just to mention in the assumptions and everything they've included here, um, for the economic potential, they didn't assume a carbon price of 50 euros a tonne uh, of CO2. So the results that they've got uh, from this um, Quite a complex chart there. Um, they looked at it first in terms of the energy potential, the energy that could be supplied 
through these six different technology routes. Um, and in terms of the technical potential, which is the yellow bars on, this, on these charts, um, that's relatively consistent across the energy production, the electricity production technologies. The two clear firing options actually look higher, but that's because the, that's including the coal element as well. And in the assumptions, they're co firing here. At 2030, they're assuming 30% co firing, and at 2050, they're assuming 50% co firing. At the moment, we've got power stations like Brax doing it at 10%. Um, but um, relatively consistent. But one of the things they identified in, through this was that, um, and this assumes that all the biomass fuel that's available goes to just one of these routes. So these cannot be combined to, to create more. It's an either or option uh, through these different technology options. But one of the things they realized um, was that the constraint on the energy that could be provided uh, is not the CO2 storage aspects, but it's actually the biomass supply, sustainable biomass supply factor in general across all of the regions uh, of the world. Um, in terms of the um, realizable potential, taking into account energy demand, forecast, carbon stock turnover, etc., there then the co-firing options <coughs> do um, um, look much stronger. And the reason for that, um, as you can imagine, is um, because you can retrofit. This is the means of an end. The, the end is the actual negative emissions that can be achieved. And this is their results then that they've, they've uh, achieved with this. So the theoretical maximum, the technical potential from the electricity sector is looking there at about 10 gigatons uh, per annum in 2050. Um, so that's quite significant. Um, that's quite significant indeed. Um, even looking at the realizable potential uh, from the power side there, you're looking at around three gigatons per annum. So if you put this into the context of the reductions required from the energy sector, from the IEA towards energy outlook, um, the 10 gigatons is equivalent to all, all, the, the, all the CCS elements within that at the moment for 2050, or um, half the renewables contribution, or um, the energy, uh, electricity, energy efficiency contribution. So it's significant. And even uh, at the realizable in the same league as CCS on, on industry, industrial plant. Um, so the numbers do come out as quite significant. And again, the, the gasification routes uh, show that the increased efficiency there um, uh, it, it, it gives a better result than um, the other technologies for the power sector. And again, the same results on, on the biofuels. Um, all these are significant, but the Fisher Fox biodiesel. Um, so it's not um, in itself a silver bullet that can be then stopped doing everything else, but it certainly um, is a significant, could be a significant um, contribution to the emissions uh, reduction. Um, and then just bearing in mind, I've used the figure at the bottom there that 48 gigatons is 2008 world energy outlook, 43 gigatons into 2010. So that's the, the potential. So it's in there, it's in there with the other technologies. It, we, um, in undertaking this work and looking at the 2030 and 2050 timescales, it became clear and I think it's very appropriate to mention the, the near term, the immediate opportunities as well. And that's for the conventional technology for bioethanol production at the moment. Um, so this is just in millions of cities. <coughs> it points out that um, both the, uh, the US and Brazil uh, that's all the significant countries in bioethanol. And this is CO2 coming off from the fermentation stage of this process. This fuels CO2, nearly fuels CO2. Um, so your capture costs are, are, are neg negligible on this. Um, so this is really low hanging fruit, but in the CCS chain, capture costs are regarded as the, the, the highest cost. Of <coughs> so there's good potential here for, for early application of CCS uh, to these sectors. And we know certainly that um, in Brazil, their bioethanol production is clustered in certain areas, so that lends itself towards a, a CCS transport <coughs> and network and hub potentially as well. So um, just worth mentioning that uh, because uh, to bring that to people's attention. And in fact, Brazil themselves uh, are looking, they have a feasibility study on CCS from one of their bioethanol plants that the GEF. 
Um, we also actually could take a look at the, 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 the barriers and the drivers um, around this and around the achieving the potential. And um, the, 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 the main, the, the, the several, but the main one is, you might expect is of what they call the CO2 value, of which there's two aspects. One is the general policy aspect. We need a higher price on CO2 to stimulate all emissions reduction technologies. And certainly that also applies in this case with biomass CCS. But also with the cap and trade based emissions trading schemes, um, not recognising biomass CCS, not recognising negative emissions, that is a problem of principle uh, there that's created as well. Um, and they also mention um, um, the uh, security, the um, sustainability of the biomass supply as being important, the competition issues that arise on land use for biomass and biomass supply between the different uses of that biomass, uh, not just food but also bioproducts as well. Um, in terms of drivers, as I mentioned at the beginning, and looking at other negative emission technologies, these are two technologies that relatively are relatively you know, well understood. And we have demonstration projects and projects in operation. So combining these um, is, is not as uh, is more achievable than other options, maybe such as direct capture from there. Um, and another barrier issue that may be a positive uh, is on the public perception side. And as, uh, as you might know, CO2 storage of geological formations in some places has faced public opposition where it's been undertaken on shore. In some places it hasn't, but in some places it has. And so yeah, it's an area of concern in general, and quite a lot of work is going on into that at the moment. Um, but combining this with biomass, would that make a difference? Um, well, I've just been, uh, I've just, uh, I'm, I'm in the uh, CTS conference in Trondheim at the moment, uh, yesterday and then later on today. Um, and there's research just out of Switzerland there where they've been looking at the public perceptions of the different biomass technologies. And there, that, that study is now saying that CO2 supply from biomass would have a positive response, would have got a positive response in terms of the public's view and their confidence in having CO2 stored uh, beneath where they live. So that's an interesting aspect. Um, there's a positive element coming out uh, of this. So ECOFIS have, have come up with several recommendations in their, client, uh, in their perspective as a consultant in taking the work, as well as the economic value on the CO2 from biomass. Um, further work going down into more detail uh, within the regions and developing uh, specific cost supply curves. Looking at, they've, they've gone for the larger potential biomass supply options, but looking at other options as well, such as the marine supply, algae and seaweed, Biomass and other utilisation options that aren't so large initially, but from CHP, for example, and uh, paper and coal. Uh, also, the work on the effects on the capture plant, combining biomass into the fuel systems, um, and also investigating co firing, co utilisation of biomass and coal in, in the Fisher Cox biodiesel facilities. Um, and also, they do flag up the early opportunities for CCS on the bioethanol in Brazil. In the USA. The, the last thing I'd just like to mention is some work separate to that that we've done um, ourselves, again, we did part of the ECOFIS, actually, Kelly Gronenberg, looking at the carbon market issues and the accounting issues, because neg negative emissions um, are not really recognised in the current systems. As I mentioned previously, the cap and trade based schemes, such as the EU emissions trading scheme, this is the world's largest and most successfully working carbon trading scheme. Um, but it's maximum, uh, and so emitters have to surrender analysis for any emissions they make. And the maximum benefit to them, the maximum reward, is when they don't emit anything, when they don't have to surrender any analysis. But that doesn't allow for negative emissions, and, uh, for emissions that have been uh, taken out of the atmosphere. And the, um, we did speak with the European Commission about the finalists and the directive that's going to work the ETS for 2013. Um, and it's really left rather ambiguous in that. Um, for the power sector, it's pretty clear that it's not taken into account. There's 
because of the allocation rules in that. So the industrial sectors, there is potential there for biomass on industrial sources to be allocated allowances in respect to things that aren't permitted. This is going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's not a general rule. Here's a very close joint implementation project-based scheme. That could work, because you're looking at business uh, emissions compared to business as usual. The CDM is the other project-based scheme in the vertical. For developing countries, so very important. But we've got the CCS and CDM issues there. Although we're looking forward to progress and work on that this year, we have progress in Cancun, and we're working towards Durban uh, with the work program there. But the good news is, the rules that every country has to follow in reporting its inventory, the IPCC greenhouse gas inventory guidelines, in its 2006 edition, has a new chapter on CCS. And within that, it recognizes negative emissions and biomass of CCS. So countries can do that, developed countries can use that. So that was all I wanted to say. The question is, is it significant? Could it be significant? I think the answer to that is, is yes, it could. So it does preserve, it does merit attention, particularly from the policy side, particularly from the incentives, getting it to be rewarded for the incentive schemes, such as the carbon market. So thank you very much for listening.